Okay, for the next two class sessions, we'll be talking about public fundraising as a revenue source. Um, in fact, what follows for a few weeks now is a discussion. We'll have multiple discussions about different revenue sources for nonprofits. For this part of public fundraising, I want you to be able to explain the ethical challenge faced by those who conduct fundraising in competitive markets. Now, as far as the public fundraising economy is concerned, it's interesting to look at just some facts and figures to see where donated money comes from. 72% um, of the money donated each year, and this is a little over $300 billion, 72% is donated by individuals. Um, now that's uh, small to large individuals. It means it's not institutional giving. That doesn't include foundations. But this number does include money given to foundations by wealthy individuals. Foundations, though, that further give to other 501c3s um, account for 15%, bequests 7%, and corporations just 6%. Uh, there's a common misconception that corporations give a lot to charity relative to private individuals and foundations. It's actually not that much. In fact, dying people give more to charity than corporations do. As far as where the money goes to, um, you can see here they are broken out by category. Um, <clears throat> uh, arts saw the largest increase last year. Uh, arts, culture, and humanities. Um, uh, religion as a category is interesting to track over time. Uh, that number uh, for a long time was actually w well over 40%. Uh, it's been steadily declining over the last couple decades. Um, just a couple years ago that number was 35%, before that 37 and so on. So that number has been gradually reducing. Um, because giving is still around 2% of uh, GDP, it's not that people are giving less, it's just that they're directing away from churches into other activities. <clears throat> a lot of churches carry out charitable activities that would fit in other categories, like human services, for example. And so there's the idea that a lot of former religious giving to help the poor is now being directed to secular organizations that help the poor. Um, and just uh, to show you guys that I'm not off my rocker or a lone voice when it comes to this 2% GDP number, here it is again from a different source. Basically, for as long as you've checked it, people give about 2% of GDP, and that's the way it's been, and probably, well, I don't know if it'll probably be that way, but it's, it looks like it will be that way for the foreseeable future. Okay, um, some other interesting facts about nationwide giving. Um, the strongest demographic predictor, other than income, <clears throat> of whether or not you give to charity is actually how often you attend religious ceremonies. <clears throat> if you attend a religious ceremony weekly, meaning, um, uh, and, and, and this is any religious activity, it doesn't matter what religion, um, then you are much more likely to give to charity and you're more likely to give uh, quite a bit more. And so, as you can see, people who go to religious ceremonies on a regular basis give quite a bit more to charity. Um, the... Uh, uh, the importance of being asked is something worth visiting that's in the reading. There's, there's just something about being asked that's really critical to uh, people giving. It should be obvious. People just don't seek out. In fact, we tend to be what I call opportunistic givers, which means we like to give to charity, but we don't seek out opportunities to give to charity. Instead, we wait for opportunities to come to us, and then we, and then we choose to give or not. Um, but as you can see, being asked is a big deal when it comes to giving to charity. So this is likely to giving, this is, sorry, um, uh, activity of giving as whether or not you were asked to give to charity. Um, uh, only 57% of households in the United States were actually asked to give in the year 2000. Um, that number is probably still true. Um, and asked households obviously also give more to charity over $800 more. Um, let's talk about now, so those are sort of the demographics of giving. Uh, let's talk about uh, um, fundraising in competitive markets. Uh, the reading lays out an argument, it, and it's pretty well documented. Uh, basically, as the number of market firms increases, market firms being nonprofits that are competing for donor dollars, as the number of nonprofits that compete for donor dollars increases, um, what happens is, the per firm fundraising cost goes down, meaning each nonprofit spends less on fundraising than they would have before. Um, the idea is that when nonprofits sense competition for donor dollars, 
they focus. So rather than ramping up their fundraising expenses, they actually spend less and focus on sort of key donors um, or key donor bases. Well, what that leads to then uh, is a reduction in fundraising costs per firm, but because you have new nonprofit firms entering the market, you actually get a total increase in fundraising costs. So each individual firm each individual nonprofit spends a little less on fundraising expenses, but the new nonprofits coming in more than offset that, so the total amount spent on fundraising actually goes up. Now, if we're really stuck at 2% of giving, the amount spent on fundraising should matter to us because it's an efficiency measure. It determines how much money is spent to raise how much money, and if we really are dealing with a fixed threshold, because that's just how people work then it could be the case that competing for donor dollars makes the world worse off because you're spending more money on fundraising. This is a, a hard thing to figure out and it's sort of an ethical question. The reason is because most, most nonprofit managers think this way. They think that promoting the success of their organization is also promoting the success of society, right? If I'm if I'm making my, my organization healthier financially, you know, if we're growing, whatever, if I run a boys and girls club and we open a new club site, right? I assume that what's happening here is my organization is better off because we're growing, but the world is better off because I'm helping more kids. Uh, but the reality in the nonprofit sector is not this simple. Um, sometimes what you do is not as good as what other people do. And the donor dollars directed to you ought to be directed to the people who are better at the work. Um, when you raise money for a less beneficial use, what's actually happening is you are promoting your organization's welfare in contrary to society's welfare, right? You're raising money for something that's not the highest and best use of those dollars. This is a hard thing for a nonprofit manager to face to ask themselves, am I really the highest and best use of donor dollars? Most nonprofit managers just take it for granted. They take it as assumed rather than asking themselves a hard question as to whether or not they truly are the highest and best use. So some questions we'll discuss in class. How do you convince someone to give to your charity over another charity? Should you convince someone to give to your charity over another charity? And an interesting question for us is whether or not a free market for altruistic opportunities will actually reach an equilibrium level. Do you remember we talked about supply and demand and we said that you know the supply curve is upward sloping for nonprofits that provide altruism. The demand curve is downward sloping, right? Because the cheaper it gets, the more people are willing to buy. We said that you know the cost of these opportunities shapes the curve. Well, there's an argument in favor of competition, which is that competition encourages lower cost altruistic opportunities. Because nonprofits compete with each other, they figure out how to do what they do better, and as a result, they help more people, um, like shown in this chart. Um, this results, results in more altruism at a lower cost, which is great. So there's an argument in favor of competition between nonprofits that maybe they should be competing for donor dollars. But there's a caveat the value of an altruistic opportunity to a donor does not always equate with overall social good. Um, and if this is true, uh, well, we need to understand why. Um, it's because of this. If a donor measures their donation by warm glow, you can create warm glow without doing good, right? You can make your donors feel great about themselves without actually making the world a better place. And if you're adept at that, you could raise a lot more money and be more competitive in a fundraising market. But warm glow doesn't feed starving children. Um, warm glow doesn't uh, rehabilitate drug addicts. And so nonprofits face this difficulty because they're in a situation where they have to decide if they really are going to compete for donor dollars and how far they'll go. Session 3.5 is gonna talk about the how as far as fundraising goes, but this is an important discussion to have before we get there because it turns out you can manipulate donors with certain tools and uh, we're going to talk about what those tools are and it's important to have an ethical foundation before we get to that. So anyway, that's it. It's a short class session. See you all in class.